Hello, everyone. Um, looking at the poll right now, glad to see that uh, everybody's excited about event sourcing. Um, if you, if I start um, stuttering, it's not me, it's the Zoom call. It's definitely not me having jitters. Okay, so we'll give it one more minute, then we'll start if that's okay with everyone. Okay, let's, uh, let's start this show. So first thing, something a little bit about me. My name is Radu Isku. I've been a solution architect for about six years now, one of which has been with uh, Yonder. I've been uh, working with .NET for about 14 years. It's been uh, mostly happy. Um, I'm also interested in IoT and ML and very big fan of controversial statements, especially when it comes to technology. Like we'll have AI in five years, general intelligence. Anyway, um, before we start, I'd like to tell you how I wound up uh, in the event sourcing conversation. It was about eight years ago. It was after the rehearsal for the presentations for a conference and all the tech people were out enjoying a beer and having a tech related conversation. And of course, there were quite a few people that were older than me uh, there. And they had their noses tipped into the architecture uh, thing. And we were talking about that. A lot of concepts came up back then, uh, refactoring and uh, how you make sure your code base is uh, in good working condition, that it's not very brittle, uh, discussions about state, functional programming, all of this jazz. And a few things caught my attention, one of which was event sourcing. I didn't know what that was, and the discussion didn't go too deep, but uh, I was left with this kind of a worm in my mind about um, event sourcing and what it is. So I started looking into it. Um, I start reading some um, material. I found out it's very popular in the domain-driven uh, design world. People are advocating for it. Um, also, it seems to solve one of my biggest problems when it comes to applications, and that is state and how to deal with it. So, yeah, I did more reading, saw a few more online presentations. And a few years later, I end up in the situation where we need to create uh, an internal app really fast for an event we were going to do. And we needed, well, I wanted to have very good tracking of what's happening with the app. So of course, what's the first thing I think? Let's use event sourcing, my new golden hammer. Two weeks later, we had the application. We even had some features in it that weren't expected when we started creating it. And it was all thanks to event sourcing. Now, before we move on, we do need to uh, deal with some uh, vocabulary setup. So first things first, what is event sourcing and what are event-oriented architectures? So an event is something that happens. We all know this from real life. Um, an event has some associated information with it. And it's just that, a piece of information about something that happened. Event sourcing applications um, actually track these events. Instead of creating a single state for the application like you would have in uh, normal enterprise apps where you have the current state of the system, event sourcing doesn't concern itself with that. You can reconstruct the state whenever you want the point is that we log everything that's happening in the application. 
Um, I also talked about state up until now, but we didn't define what state is. State is that part of your application that tells you what's going on right now. So if uh, some of you are old enough, you can remember back in the days of um, SVN that we all had this single state that we were working with. You had to um, request access to a file, then you would lock that file you would do your edits, then you would submit that file. Uh, this meant that during your uh, normal working, what would happen is uh, you would need multiple files, you would check those out. Then uh, somebody would need one of your files and they either had to wait for you or um, you would have to release your file, maybe with your uh, commits in there. And then Git came along and said, uh, well, yeah, we don't care about that. We like forking stuff. We like multiple copies in different states. And we're going to let the user decide exactly what's going to happen and when. So these are two kind of contrasting uh, ways of looking at states. On one, we have a single state. Anybody wants to do that, we need to wrap the whole thing in a transaction, make sure nothing bad happens. And if something bad happens, then, well, good luck you're gonna have a really interesting time dealing with the situation. Whereas Git is, yeah, we have multiple copies. If the main Git repository goes down, we'll just see who has the latest copy and reinstate that. So from that point of view, Git's a bit more reliable. It also gives you a bit more flexibility because it doesn't really care about the current state. Now, the reason why I mentioned state is because when I started on this uh, journey, what happened to me was that I got infected with the functional bug uh, where the main thing that functional programming is trying to address is the fact that state is considered harmful in an application. What that means is that whenever you take decisions based on the current state, you absolutely must have that current state. In event source applications, you don't really care. So most event source applications rely on the eventual consistency model. Uh, or at least people tend to think about them that way. Personally, I don't really care. I don't think it's important when you have uh, in real life situations where, um, for instance, if you're doing the, an inventory uh, of say a, your backlot and you notice that something's missing from real life, but the application where do you store the information doesn't agree with it, which one's right. So in an event source system, you really don't care that much about the current state of affairs, although we'll talk about this more later. So another thing that we have to talk about is ledgers. What's a ledger? If you have ever uh, logged into a piece of software, you know, that uh, there's a log somewhere that says you logged in. That's a ledger. You're probably more familiar with the Bitcoin ledger, which is the ledger of all the transactions that have happened on a particular block of time. And ledgers are meant to be, you know, write only. You write as much as you want in there, but you can never edit it. You have a separate entry for going in, a separate entry for, go, for going out. Now, what's important to understand is that in event source systems, you don't have to have a single ledger. You can have multiples, uh, each one dealing with a particular aspect of your application. So for instance, you have a ledger for user actions, you have another one for invoices, and so on and so forth. Another very important thing to deal with is pipelines. Now, this is a concept that most people don't tend to talk about when discussing event sourcing, what a pipeline is, what it does, and why it's there. Basically, pipelines allow you to deal with events in a very simple manner. Uh, you have a pool of events. Usually, they're not um, homogenous. You have multiple types of events that you want to deal with. You put these events in a queue and then you start operating on that queue. If you've ever worked with uh, reactive extensions, reactive JS or anything like this, and you're familiar with how pipelines are supposed to work, basically you wrap the events that are coming from disparate sources into a single uh, pipeline. 
then you start operations on it. You do things such as filtering. So for instance, when the user double clicks, you can um, try to create your own event for a double click, but what's easier to do is actually create a filter for two clicks that are spaced out a certain amount of time between them. This gives you the opportunity to write easier to read code. It also gives you locality. Um, you see what's going in, you see what operations are being done, and you see what's going out of the pipeline. Uh, this really simplifies um, development a lot. And I'm really sorry I didn't uh, have this back in the day when I started working with event sourcing. And by the way, you don't have these right now. You kind of have to write them your own. Anyway, another concept that we have to talk about is aggregates or, or projections, depending on which environment you're coming from. So for... Um, uh, developers, it's usually called an aggregate because what you're doing is taking a set of data and then you're uh, creating an aggregate. If you're coming from a maths or physics standpoint, you're going to call these projections because you have a set of data and then you're projecting off of that uh, into the results that you want to see. So in this particular case, um, aggregates are like your bank account statement at the end of the month. You see what uh, entries come in, you see what entries come out, you see a total at the end. So in this case, the total would be the aggregate. That's a very simple aggregate, but there are, can be more complex aggregates. So for instance, uh, in this particular case, if we're looking at the balance sheet of a company, you would have uh, various, various cash flows, um, which are added up from all the transactions in a month. You would see your inventory, which are, is also generated from a bunch of events uh, from your application and so on and so forth. Now, before we continue, I would like to try to contextualize these events in the case of the application that I was talking about earlier. Um, the application that we were trying to make was a triathlon in VR for uh, people who are trying to join our company. What you had to do was climb up a mountain and at each step of the way, you would have a form that you would have to fill in with information and to answer questions of a technical nature. Why I went with event sourcing is because I wanted to see user interaction while it was happening. I wanted to see if users had problems with various parts of the application. <clears throat> this would allow us to tweak the complexity of different steps. So for instance, if we saw that too many users were having problems on the first step, there was um, a big incentive for us to optimize that to make sure that it's easier for people to make it further. And also, uh, we wanted to be able to track uh, the time between when a user signed up for the application and the time they were able to actually uh, join and play the game. And uh, besides all of this, if it was possible, we also wanted to know if anybody was cheating either during the testing of the application or during the actual deployment during the event. So in this particular case, the state of the application was um, split into multiple parts. There was the state of the signup process. There was the state of the uh, queue of users that we were waiting for. And there was also the state of the game being played plus the one at the end where we would uh, say, okay, this is the total of everything that happened. Uh, these are the winners for our contest. So that means we had multiple ledgers. Uh, we had um, events that would go into multiples of these ledgers. So whenever you would solve a form, it would get added to, uh, depending on what form it was, it would be getting added to either one or the other um, uh, ledger. We also had pipelines which were necessary because parts of our application were made in, um, in um, 
a web-oriented app. So we that meant that we had to address certain things like our application would lodge an event that somebody requested some piece of information. Then we would have to go compute that information and then present it back to the user. And we needed a way to loop all of this. So whenever we fired off an event, we can reply to the event coming back uh, that addressed our concerns in our uh, event. So we built all of this and we had quite a few benefits. So what problems does event sourcing uh, solve? First one is end temporal representations. You probably haven't bumped into this because if you're working in, um, in an application that's not event sourced, you're used to having one state. Your, if your system has one state, then you have one temporal representation of your system. In an end temporal uh, application, you can have multiple. So for instance, if you look at Git, you can see here a history of commits and you would see if you were in a normal application, you would see the last state as being the current state. So if you're working with SVN or TFS, you would only have the last state and maybe any huge branch that is made there. Uh, however, Git doesn't care about that. Git doesn't care which is the latest branch, doesn't care which is master. That's just UI fluff to help you uh, deal with the intricacies of working with multiple variants of the same code base, of the same data. So what Git does is whenever somebody is trying to do a transaction, like uh, first I need to check out the code, then I need to modify it, then I need to put it back, it splits off the state in two uh, different versions. There's one that's the official version, which all um, further branches are leaving from, and then the one, there's the one you have. Um, the advantage of having end temporal representations uh, goes a bit deeper than that because um, assuming Git is used correctly, you can go back in time and see, for instance, if a bug was introduced, you can go and see exactly what the history of that introduction was. What were the tasks being worked on? Um, what were the other states the system was in? So for instance, if um, this bug was reintroduced, then it means it was fixed at some point and then uh, somebody put it back in which allows you, uh, if you're using Git, this allows you to go back, see exactly what was, who was working on what and exactly what was the commit that reintroduced the bug. Another very interesting thing that happens with end temporal representations is that you can fix errors. I don't know how many of you have uh, had the situation where you have this uh, big new release which introduces a huge feature on top of existing data you deploy the feature, everything works great. And then one week later, you find out from one customer that's, hey, um, all the entries for um, our application are now broken. And you're like, okay, we'll investigate this. And then some other users are coming in and telling you, hey, our application is broken. And you realize it's a big problem. You work on a fix. You try to put the fix uh, back in the application. But for some users, their um, data is corrupted for others it's not and you have to deal with figuring out whose data is broken whose is not how to fix it and then you have to do a patch and hope that you get everything right on the first try because it usually doesn't work that way so if you end up in a situation like this where you have only one state for the application any modification or error correction that you try to do the, to that state it's not going to go down easy. So how does end temporal uh, representation of the data help you with this? Um, when you work with ledgers, as they are specified uh, in the old traditions like banking and uh, asset tracking and stuff like this, what you learn is that, for instance, if a company makes an invoice to our company, and instead of writing 900 uh, euros, they write 9,000 by mistake. And since we have an automated system, the payment gets made. Or if you're using humans and they don't pay attention, payment gets made. 
there are two ways you can deal with this. One is, hey, give us uh, 8,100 of our euros back. Or you could say, give us our 9,000 euros back and then make the proper transaction because we're canceling this one. Uh, this introduces the concept of a reconciliation event. So basically you had a mess up, now you have to fix it. What you do is you revert the previous mess up and then do the correct transaction. So if you're just looking at the current state of the application, everything's fine. But if anybody wants to do um, a review to see if anything was, um, you know, illegal, they will really appreciate the fact that the math is easy. They see, okay, this is the, the wrong transaction that was, uh, that happened. It was reverted and then we moved on to the correct one. If you're not doing this, then uh, you're not gonna make a lot of friends when it comes to auditors. Anyway, a huge advantage of this approach is that when you're um, working on an application and you have this huge, um, update to your um, to the way you're doing things, you deploy the application, you find out some entries got corrupted, you can address just those entries, you revert the data to its previous format, and then you overwrite it with uh, new events that put the application in the correct state. And you can do this either on a per customer basis, if they're all caused by different bugs. Um, you can um, also deploy hotfixes re relatively rapidly to your application. And then this just creates that out of band way of working that we're so used to from Git. Yes, there is a bug, it's not a problem. We can fix it, we can patch it. Then there's CDCI taking over the whole thing and it will just make its way to production. Um, another huge advantage that um, event source systems have is the fact that they have no problem with distributed transactions. Now, I kind of alluded to this earlier when I said uh, that uh, Git has no problem with huge transactions, specifically transactions huge in time. Um, so for instance, we're all used to transactions taking very little uh, time because, hey, I want to modify multiple tables and tables in a database, I need to do that then um, the, if everything was great, then we commit the transaction and we're golden. What happens though, if you have long lived transactions? So for instance, um, if a company needs to have a very complicated process for approving, I don't know, a merger, uh, then you're going to have a really long process which can be encapsulated in a, in a transaction what you do is you take all of the steps that need to go into this transaction, all of the modifications, and at the end you can see, is this uh, done or not? The problem comes when you cannot commit that transaction and you have to revert all of the systems back to their previous state. If you're dealing with large applications that have this sort of a flow, so for instance, you need uh, transaction approval, uh, maybe uh, multiple, multiple stakeholders that need to approve a particular transaction and that can take quite a bit of time. So for instance, George is on a vacation and he'll come back only on Thursday. That means we have to wait three days until he's back and only then can we continue with this. I don't know about how most uh, transaction managers work but they usually, I would expect them to uh, not deal with this very well. On the other hand, you also have the fact that the system, parts of your system are now caught in a transaction that they can't commit on, and they may need that information later. So for instance, if you're doing, um, say, the software for a company that deals with um, vacations, when you book a vacation, you need to book an air ticket, you need to book uh, the room, you have a lot of uh, places uh, where you have long running operations, that need to be registered and then reverted in case something uh, happens. So for instance, I, I booked your flight, but I'm still waiting for the, for the hotel. Then the hotel says, no, we can't actually give you a room. Then you have to revert the air ticket uh, 
transaction as well, and then put the system in a situation where it's uh, okay. For this, um, event sourcing like has no problem with it because what you're dealing with is, okay, you have an event for starting the, um, uh, the process. You have an event for requesting the ticket from the um, air company. Then you have one for the hotel, then any tours you might need so on and so forth. And if any of these doesn't uh, go okay, then you can simply go back and uh, issue events that cancel the ones that have already been uh, sent out. Because you have the whole transaction history of what's happening, you can actually do this. And by the way, this is exactly what your uh, relational database does in the back end. If you've ever tried to do um, database replication, then you know most serious uh, database solutions rely on uh, transaction log shipping, which means that basically what we're doing is sharing the transaction log with the other machines. So your master machine accepts all the transactions, then at some point in time, it will ship the transactions that have happened since the last shipment to the other users. They can apply them to their current state and then they can serve it. Um, right. Another big advantage is testing. Um, if you have an application that just deals with events and then takes a bunch of events and aggregates them into a result, it's very simple to do the testing because all you have to do is record or write some events, and then you just have to run them through your piece of code. There's no state to deal with. There's nothing that can go wrong. It's just super easy. And, uh, Doing complicated stuff like doing flows through the application is relatively easy. You just have the events that you care about put in a file somewhere and then that just gets run through the system. Also means that it's very easy to reproduce production issues unless they're related to uh, threading and other things where you can take the transaction log from the database, the events that are relative to the bug, you can run them through your code and see exactly what happens. Another big advantage is what I like to call post-mortem features. I was telling you about that application. One of the things that we didn't have time to do, but we still had at the end of the day was uh, cheater detection. So we were, I was interested in the cheaters because I wanted to see which one of the applicants of our, uh, of, to our company uh, were really giving the time to understand how the application worked, uh, where its weak points were and how they could game the system because I thought anybody who had the technical ability to do that was somebody we would like to talk to. So uh, the, the great advantage was that we had the application running without this feature during the event. I mean, we could still look at the logs and see uh, if anybody was cheating, but we didn't have to have the code to do that. Uh, two days later, we wrote the code and we saw exactly who our persons of interest were. Another example of a post-mortem feature is if you have a shopping cart, right? You add products to it, then at the end, uh, you click buy and it goes through the whole uh, process. What happens if you've built it in a um, normal relational database way and one of your product owners or one of the stakeholders of the application comes in and says, okay, we need to know which of our users uh, removed products uh, five minutes before um, clicking buy. Because those people would really like that product, but they can't afford it now, they took it out. We would like to know who those are, so maybe we can give them some discounts or stuff like that maybe advertise the product so they don't forget they, they want them. If you're using a relational database, that means that you have to create the code that does this, stores the information in the rela relational database, you need to deploy the code into production, and then you can start using it. If you're using event sourcing for this, what's going to happen is that you're going to say, oh, okay, not a problem you're going to be able to give those people back six months or how long you keep your logs 
you're going to be able to um, ship this functionality and still uh, see the logs and the information from um, previous months. This is basically showing you uh, a quick and easy way how to get uh, to market really fast with a feature uh, while also using historical information <clears throat> that might not have been initially in the format you wanted. Okay, so let's address some of the misconceptions about uh, event sourcing. First off, CQRS commands and events. Now, CQRS was first developed as a way to separate commands from queries in huge applications because you needed to have that, especially when you were dealing with uh, database replication. So that means that if you have an interface whenever you're writing to a data store where you separate between the commands that alter the system and the queries that just uh, investigate what's going on with the state, then you're gonna have a very easy time dealing with this. It also nice, acts as a nice point cut for whenever you need to introduce new code that deals with uh, events uh, related to various parts of the application that cannot be handled there. This means that in a command, it's very easy to generate events. On the other hand, you don't actually need CQRS to do this. Um, in fact, CQRS is usually uh, a bad idea in event source applications, and you should only use it if you're transferring an existing application that has CQRS built into it uh, into an event source application. And at the end, you can just drop it. If you no longer have anything that edits the database, no longer that uh, sets the current state of the application, then you no longer need CQRS. Another important uh, thing to deal with is fire and forget events. Now, a lot of talks about event sourcing discuss that you can't have fire and forget events because if you can't update an event to annotate it, that it was um, already handled, you can't have the impotence and a few other things that you really care about. And this is where I'm like, no guys, that's not how you do it. First of all, you absolutely need fire and forget events because of that ability to be able to add uh, features at a later time while still retaining the data. That's one. And two, what happens if the event was dealt with, but the crash of the application happened while you were saving the, uh, the edit to the event? You don't want that. The solution to this is very simple. What you have to do is for each event, have a resolution event. So either a success or a failure or multiple types of success and multiple types of failures. But for each event, you want to see that there was a finality. If there wasn't a finality to it, it means that when your application um, spins back up, it needs to deal with that event. Um, I hope that was understood. So let's move on to the summary. Okay, so vocabulary for this is still in flux. That's why I insisted on uh, having the vocabulary first in the discussion. So you're going to see a lot of terms being vehiculated by various people. Nobody's written the book on event sourcing yet, even though it's probably the oldest technology for making sure our data is uh, good and proper. Um, Ledgers should be write only read many. If your application uh, needs to edit the ledger, you're probably not doing event sourcing. You're just, you know, doing a single state in your whole application, but just doing it in a very complicated way. Uh, CQRS is bad unless you're transitioning an app. Even then, there are other ways of dealing with the problem. So maybe don't look at CQRS and low you, unless you already know what you're doing very well. Uh, and temporal representations are great. They allow you to have all sorts of uh, development process features that you wouldn't be able to have otherwise. It allows you to look at the system in various states. You can see any errors that were generated in the application, why they were generated, how, <clears throat> human error could have been inspired by the uh, state of the system at a particular time. 
so on and so forth. The only way for doing things reliably, in my opinion, is event sourcing. Because like I said, whenever uh, bad things happen, you have a very good way of figuring out what happened and how to fix it. It's a very old technology as things go. There's fire, writing, and ledgers. In fact, writing was probably invented to keep ledgers. Uh, and yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it's the oldest and probably the only good way of doing things. Right. Okay, questions. Okay, so I have a question here. How do we deal with snapshots? So I didn't mention snapshots in the talk on, up until now. When you have a ledger with lots of events, <clears throat> um, snapshots are a way of um, simplifying calculations. So if, for instance, we're dealing with uh, an inventory, what uh, we do is for each operation where we're taking things out and putting things out into the, I don't know, warehouse, we have events. <clears throat> At the end of a month, we do an inventory, we see what's missing, we see what's still there, even though it shouldn't be. And we make this uh, reconciliation event where we say, okay, this was the state at the end of the month. From now on, any new events only have to deal from this point forward. So whenever you get interested in uh, discussions about event sourcing, you're going to bump into uh, things like, when do I put my snapshots? Where do I put them? Um, my answer is simple put them in the same place as the rest of your information in the ledger. That way, when you're replaying the events, uh, it's very easy to reset. You also have chunks. Uh, this is also what Bitcoin does. You have a block for transactions that get signed. Just make sure that things um, stay in their uh, particular place. You can also make sure that each event acts as its own snapshot. So for instance, uh, it can have the previous state of the system and the current state of the system, as well as any information of how that state was reached. This is usually quite disk expensive. However, um, storage these days is dropping in price quite a lot. So I don't particularly see that as a problem. Uh, one solution of doing this is starting with every 10 entries you drop um, um, a snapshot, but uh, you need to adapt to the needs of your system. So for instance, one ledger can have a snapshot every 10 days, one per month, one per year, one every 100 years, and so on and so forth. I hope that was clear. Any other questions? I guess not. Um, I'd like to thank you all for um, staying with us uh, for all the presentations, and I would uh, like to wish you a nice evening. <laughs>